Edward, Part Five, Chapter Five, in the Crystal Tower. Inside the tower, Edward's first impression was of whiteness. Floors, walls, ceiling, all were white and radiated light. The footsteps made soft crunching noises on the rough floor surface. Except for that, it was very still, with occasional soft, unrecognizable far-off sounds. Moreland moved confidently through winding halls and long rooms. He seemed very black and all that white. They passed long pools of water with fountains that sparkled in the light. "'Where is everyone?' Edward whispered. "'At table, I hope. I'm hungry, aren't you?' "'No.' Abruptly a big, broad, ugly shape appeared in front of them and reared a challenge. Edward grabbed for Moreland's arm with both hands. Roland shook him off irritably. God, boy, don't grab my sword arm if you ever do spot a monster. Stay clear. But Moreland didn't reach for his blade. He stood still while the monster wrapped its long arms around him and pounded on his back, still roaring. Moreland roared back and pounded on the monster's chest. They introduced Edward to the captain of the Archmagister's guild. Don't hug him, Moreland warned the troll, who grinned at Edward, showing pointy teeth. He'll break. I thought trolls were dangerous, Edward gasped as they ascended a long winding stairway. They are. I'll have bruises for a fortnight. I'd have shielded, but I didn't like to hurt his feelings. He likes you? Oh, I it could be done, you see. Why does the Archmagister keep troll guards? They keep the rats down. More trolls, but he's paid them little heed. Another long stairway, more corridors, a sort of guard room where three trolls appeared to be gaming with bones. One of them shambled to his feet and led them down a shadowy passage, a row of cages with huge rats, then some with small odd creatures that looked rather like elves seen in a badly distorted mirror, though Edward kept this observation to himself. They gobbled and squeaked as the elf and boy paced quickly by. Goblins, Morland said with distaste. They turned a corner and went past two cages that held only large stone statues. There seemed to be more cages off down in other hallways. The troll unlocked a huge black metal door. It clanged shut behind them. A very large green and yellow hooped creature sat man-like in one corner. Its unwinking eyes didn't flicker as they passed quickly and climbed still another stair. More white halls. These were patrolled by huge black dogs that sniffed at them as they passed. Edward stretched a hand to pet one, but it snarled at him. I wouldn't, Morland said. Yes, sir. And they came to another massive black metal door. A voice sounded. What is black and white, has one body, two heads, four arms, four legs, two red eyes, and two brown? That's disgusting, Morland yelled at the door, hands on hips. You are correct, mortal. You may pass. The door swung slowly open, creaking. There was no one behind it, just a narrow stairway that wound sharply. It seemed dark above. Morland raced up the stairs, leaving Edward clinging at the bottom rail, shaking. There was not a thing to do but follow. Welcome, Edward. The Archmagister stood white and gold in the center of a large dim room. Huge windows looked out on the purple, twilit sea below. Come here, child. Give me your hands. Edward put his hands in the Archmagister's, who smiled down at him. Edward's fatigue and fear vanished instantly. He smiled back at the Archmagister, who said softly, It is well. You may go. To the furious dark elf, who stood glowering to one side, Edward was barely aware of him, his whole attention occupied by the Archmagister. Goodbye, Edward. Bye, Edward didn't take his eyes off the Archmagister. From far away, he heard Dark Elf go down the stairs. He calls you son, the Archmagister said. Yes, sir, I asked him if I might call him father. But you are not entirely comfortable about it. Edward sighed. No, sir. That may be as well. You will return to Daggerfall one day. Then you must be Cork's son. So let this claim be on Morland's side. 
The Archmaster moved companionably to the windows with him. The dusk was fast gathering as Edward stared out over the hill with which they had journeyed. A dark figure appeared below and strode swiftly off into the night. That's Morlin. I thought he was going to stay the night. It's dangerous out there alone in the dark. There are evil things out there, can't you? Dangerous for any evil that beats Morlin in his present mood. He will go safely, I promise you. Oh, but I haven't thanked him. He's been very kind, really. Why was he so angry about the door? It was just a silly question. The door was him and my mother while they were asleep, and I'm not there. How do you make a door talk? Is it an illusion? That's three questions. Which of them do you want answered? Aren't you hungry? Would you like a bowl of stew? Yes, please. I'd hear, like to hear about the door, please. Ah, uh, you think the docking door may prove more comprehensible than a surly dark elf? More interesting, or safer? The Archmagister's large golden eyes regarded the boy thoughtfully. I don't know if I uh, like him. Sometimes I think I... And then other times I... Do you understand about liking? He said he didn't. You would be more comfortable if you felt the same way about him at all times, yet you do not. Yes, that's it exactly. You do understand. Moreland is not a comfortable man. Well, I don't mean that exactly. Sometimes he is, like when we rode the dragon. And the Archmaster laughed aloud. His laughter reminded Edward of chimes. Yes, yes, I will find comfort myself in having Morlin near at hand when dragons are about. A young high elf brought in a bowl of stew and set it down on the table. Edward felt a bit disappointed that the stew had come in such an ordinary way. Still, he remembered that the Archmagister hadn't sent for the stew. The priest at home in Daggerfall said it was a mark of evil things, that they cannot bear the light, Edward said between mouthfuls. Morlin doesn't like sunlight. And he's black. I see. Do you know what evil is? Um, well, if you do bad things, then you're evil? I see. If the cook had burnt the stew, would he then be evil? Edward grinned. No, just a bad cook. But if he did it on purpose, then I guess he'd have done an evil thing. But maybe he wouldn't be altogether evil. Maybe he was just angry about something. Or perhaps the sort of person who is pleased by spoiling others' pleasure? I guess that'd make my little brothers evil. They sure like to spoil my fun. And you? Edward felt his face redden. I don't take any notice of them, he said quickly. The Archmagister's large golden eyes regarded him steadily. To his own dismay, Edward began to cry. He bawled like a baby. I don't really know what's wrong with me, he gasped. I never cry, really I don't. Hardly ever. Why ever not? Edward looked up. His tears had blurred his sight, but there seemed to be tears on the Archmagister's face. His hand reached up to feel the wetness. "'You have been very alone, have you not?' the Archmagister said. "'Yes, until you brought the unicorn for me. I was all alone. They endure no evil.' Edward sighed with satisfaction, feeling relaxed and comfortable. The Archmagister was wonderful. We summoned the unicorn, Morland the dragon, and I the others. It's a great magic, and one no single man or woman may command. But don't trouble yourself over much with judging good and evil. That's a human notion. Life is complex. I know of nothing that is wholly good or wholly evil, not even the unicorn. Edward's time in the tower passed quickly. There were few other novices, and the youngest of these was several years older than Edward. The boy spent several hours each day with the Archmagister. He learned to cast a few spells and open his mind so that he could renew his magic quickly while he slept. But often they just talked. Sometimes Edward was given a book to read. Other times he was allowed to choose one from the thousands in the library. He usually tired of them quickly. He didn't read Elvish script easily. His tutor had taught him the letters but their few books were in Bredic. Spell casting was more fun. Fire spells came easily to him, and he learned to shield himself readily, but to his chagrin, he couldn't heal at all. He invariably made things worse for the unlucky rats he was allowed to practice on. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, Edward cried out in frustration. He sent a dart of fire at the 
writhing rat than it turned into charred corpse. Edward, it will be well if you let the heal spells wait a while yet. More than said light here is the first spell anybody learns, Edward said sulkily. Did he? Well, he is a practitioner of magic, not a theorist. Even I would hesitate to say what a Breton might or might not learn, and when he might learn it. You are the first of your people with whom I have worked. Certainly Moreland has had no experience with your race, except for your mother, of course. My mother can't do magic. No, but we think the ability lies within her. She has not been able to learn to master it, possibly because she was too old when she first tried. If you want my opinion, it is your thoughts and not your hands which are causing your difficulty. Weeping might help. I don't feel like crying, Edward said rather sullenly. He felt more like kicking something, although incinerating the rat had helped relieve some of that. Meditation might help, then. 